Welcome back to Hair Cafe University Hair Loss Switchers. It is my pleasure to welcome you to lesson two of my series on how to do research like a hair loss witcher. In the first part, I gave you some practical tips on how to actually get research into your hands, which is a lot harder than it should be. That's because the publishers of medical journals try to rip you off by putting a lot of research behind a paywall. So instead of going through the trouble and expense of obtaining articles, a lot of would-be research witchers just read the titles and abstracts of research that they can get for free from PubMed. However, to be a true research witcher, you have to read the whole article, not just the title and the abstract. That's the only way you can properly analyze the quality of the research, and you can't do that just from reading a short summary of an article on PubMed. So, in case you haven't watched part one, please be sure to do so, as even the most knowledgeable research witcher would be powerless without the means to acquire research. That first part is very important. In this second part of the series, though, I'm going to talk about the different types of research studies and what types of research studies are the most valuable to you as a research witcher and a hair loss witcher. There's a lot of research published every single year, and the number of articles being published per year is increasing exponentially. So it is critically important to be able to evaluate if a study is a good study or if it is just some outlier study that doesn't really prove anything. Many people who are new to research either just accept everything they see as gospel because it's a study or they just shut down completely and refuse to trust anything science related. Both approaches are wrong. It is possible to determine if a study is good and trustworthy and I intend to teach you how. So what makes a study good? Well. Let's take a look at this diagram here. It's what is called the Pyramid of Evidence, also known as the Hierarchy of Scientific Evidence. It shows that there is a hierarchy of evidence, meaning some types of studies or articles are more reliable as evidence than others. The higher up a study type is in the pyramid, the higher the quality of evidence. You can find some slightly different versions of this pyramid online, but all these pyramids will rank expert opinions, case reports, and anecdotes down at the very bottom. And above that, there will be cohort studies, also known as observational studies, and still higher up, you will find randomized controlled trials, and at the top, there are meta-analyses and systematic reviews. All these types of studies can be divided into the categories primary research and secondary research. Primary research is just individual studies, like case reports, observational studies, and randomized controlled studies. Secondary research combines multiple primary studies together into meta-analyses and systematic reviews. Even though it may seem counterintuitive, secondary research is actually more reliable and more valuable than primary research. That's because secondary research takes into account more than just one study. Ideally, secondary research takes into account all the published research that is available. That's important because it's very easy to cherry pick some outlier study to try to prove a point while ignoring all the studies that contradict the point you are trying to make. That's known as confirmation bias and it is a very common tactic that's used by scammers who will select studies based not on the quality of research but instead they just present the studies that agree with what they believe while it's conveniently at the same time they will ignore the research that contradicts their biases. Getting back to the evidence pyramid you can see that at the very bottom there is a category called expert opinion but people will often confuse expert opinion, which is at the lowest point of the pyramid, with systematic reviews and clinical practice guidelines, which are at the highest point of the pyramid. They look at an article like this one and will say something like, but Kevin, that article is just an expert opinion. That's at the bottom of the evidence pyramid. That article is just an appeal to authority fallacy. Didn't you know that, bro? No, Chooms. This article is not just an expert opinion. This is actually a systematic review that is based on many other studies that it analyzes. It is an analysis of multiple meta-analyses, so in a sense, it is a meta-meta-analysis. So, even though something is written by a group of experts, that doesn't mean it is just an opinion if it is backed up by actual studies. No, an example of an expert opinion, though I'd be very reticent to use a word like expert in this context, would be something like this article by Paul Taylor, published in the discredited pseudoscientific journal called Medical Hypotheses. The article is titled, quote, Big Head, Bald Head, School Expansion, Alternative Model for the Primary Mechanism of Androgenic Alopecia, unquote. That's the article where Paul Taylor just looked out the window one morning and then he decided, based on that one observation, that bald people have funny shaped skulls. Literally, that's all what happened. Based on that one stupid observation, he decided that expanding skulls were what was 
actually causing baldness, and he built an entire business model based off this one observation. Of course, that's completely ridiculous, but that's why so-called expert opinion is at the bottom of the evidence pyramid. It's because there are too many morons like Mr. Taylor who call themselves experts. And for an article like Paul Taylor's article, I'd probably bury it a few hundred feet below the base of the pyramid. Paul Taylor is one of the biggest idiots in the hair loss industry, which is saying quite a lot. And if you want to know more about that, I'll link my video below where I properly mock him for being a hairline fraud sale and snake oil salesman sale. So don't mix up expert opinions with systematic review articles written by expert chums. This is a common technique that is used to muddy the waters by certain people in the carnivore community especially. When I showed this article in one of my videos, carnivore people told me that it's just my opinion, but it's not. This is a systematic review written by a group of experts that synthesizes all the medical research on the subject of LDL cholesterol and heart disease. That's actually the highest form of medical research. It's not just an opinion. Okay. There are also other ways to classify research too. For example, you can divide research into basic laboratory research that uses cell cultures or animal models like mice or rats versus clinical or epidemiological research that studies individual humans or populations of humans. While basic research is very important for identifying mechanisms and also for testing out new drugs, it is important to realize that this is no substitute for human research. I mean, I don't need to tell you chums this. I'm sure you guys have seen plenty of mouse studies of a new hair loss treatment that works great in mice, but then turns out to be totally useless for human beings. The problem here is that mice are obviously not humans. Mice have different types of hairs from humans. They have a different hair cycle. They have less sensitivity to DHT. They have differences in their hair stem cells, and they even have a different skin architecture compared with humans. So you can't extrapolate mice research directly to humans. People put way too much emphasis on mice research especially when it tells them what they want to hear or if they have an agenda, as we see with the PFS crowd. One example of this is all the research on the effects of finasteride on mouse behavior. But the big problem with that research is that in mice, finasteride blocks the type 1 5-air isoenzyme, while in humans, it barely affects the type 1 5-air isoenzyme at all. That's an important difference here, Chooms, because the effects on brain neurosteroids are mediated by the type 1 5-air isoenzyme. So none of these mouse studies on brain neurosteroids actually apply in any way to human beings. The other kind of research that some pseudoscientific scammers often like to rely on is mechanistic research. They'll claim that because some specific biochemical mechanism has been identified in the human body, no actual outcome research needs to be done. They'll make claims like, because of the Randall cycle, people should only eat eat meat. This is called the mechanistic fallacy because it is preposterous and naive to predict the responses of human physiology based on one small biochemical reaction like the carnivore dieters do with their beloved Randall cycle. The problem here is that none of these biochemical reactions exist in isolation. They are influenced by the hundreds or even thousands or tens of thousands of other reactions going on in cells at the same time. Here's what a review article on the Randall cycle concludes. Quote, the intricate interactions between glucose and fatty acid metabolism, originally described in the glucose fatty acid cycle, are far more complex than originally proposed as revealed by new molecular insights, including allosteric control, reversible phosphorylation, and expression of key enzymes, unquote. So to put that into layman's terms here, Chooms, nobody fucking cares about the Randall cycle because it doesn't matter. The biochemistry of life is extremely complex, with lots of feedback mechanisms and signaling pathways all going on at the same time time. Although a lot of the biochemistry has been worked out, there are still many unknowns in how all these reactions interact with each other. So for all the confounding variables carnivore clowns like to cry about when it comes to associative data, it's actually mechanistic data that has the most confounding variables by far. It literally has tens of thousands of them. So that's not to say that mechanistic data is completely worthless. It definitely has its place in scientific research for establishing a hypothesis. But in order to make any strong claims about all these basic research studies and mechanistic studies, you absolutely must have human outcome studies in order to validate the hypothesis that these basic studies generate. But a lot of the carnivore influencers as well as cholesterol deniers and DHT simps will just dismiss human outcome research entirely because it doesn't tell them what they want to hear. They'll say things like, association can never inform upon causation. Or they'll say things like, you can never control for confounding factors. Didn't you know that? 
That's all completely wrong, Chums. But they say these things to discard the thousands of well-designed clinical research studies that completely negate their claims and that absolutely do establish causation and do not have confounding factors, unlike the mechanistic data they venerate all the time. So, let's talk about the design of human clinical research studies. Let's start close at the bottom of the evidence pyramid and talk about case reports. Case reports are really just fancy anecdotes, though they are definitely a step above the type of anecdotes that you read on Reddit because these are reports that are usually peer-reviewed and published in a medical journal. The main value of case reports is similar to mechanistic data in that they're useful for generating hypotheses, but if they can't be validated with stronger research, then they are completely worthless, and worse than that, they could be completely misleading too. For example, there have been some isolated cases of low sperm counts on phenetics Finasteride. So, from these case reports alone, you could hypothesize that finasteride might cause low sperm counts. So, this hypothesis was actually tested in two large randomized control trials, and one of them showed no effect of finasteride on sperm production, while the other one showed just some minor decreases in sperm function that were not clinically significant and that were completely reversible upon stopping finasteride. So, the point here is that case reports can identify possible side effects from a drug, but it takes a randomized control trial to put these side effects into production perspective. Based on the randomized control trials, we can conclude that finasteride does not cause fertility problems in the vast majority of users. However, if someone has borderline sperm parameters to begin with, they can then possibly improve their fertility by temporarily stopping finasteride because if there are any problems of fertility related to finasteride, the problems are minor and are completely reversible. And if you want to know more about the subject of fertility, I actually made a video on that specific subject, so I'll go ahead and link that below if you're interested. Case reports can also be used to show that a medical hypothesis is actually false. For example, when low-dose oral minoxidil first came into vogue, people claimed without any evidence whatsoever that it did not cause pericardial effusions. A pericardial effusion is when fluid builds up in the sac around the heart. That can cause a life-threatening problem called cardiac tamponade, and that's where the fluid compresses the heart so it can no longer pump blood. Unfortunately, we know that even low doses of oral minoxidil can indeed cause pericardial effusions, just like with higher doses of oral minoxidil. It seems that the dose is idiosyncratic. We know this thanks to at least a half dozen case reports of pericardial effusions that have occurred on low dose oral minoxidil. So, even though we don't have prospective studies showing the exact incidence of pericardial effusion with low dose oral minoxidil, we do know from case reports that it can indeed occur. It probably is very rare, but we don't don't know how rare it is exactly, and since it is a life-threatening side effect that we're talking about here, Chooms, that is the reason I still don't recommend oral minoxidil for hair loss on my channel. But honestly, Chooms, in general, case reports are not very useful as scientific research, which is why they are at the very bottom of the hierarchy of scientific evidence. So. Let's move up the pyramid a little bit to observational studies, also known as cohort studies. Observational studies are either prospective or retrospective. So, to better understand the difference between those, let me give you some examples. Let's say, for example, you want to see if sunscreen use reduces the risk of skin cancer. In a prospective observational study, you would survey maybe 5,000 subjects and then give them a questionnaire about whether or not they regularly use sunscreen. You would then follow these subjects over 10 years and record episodes of skin cancer. Then you could determine if there was a lower incidence of skin cancer in the sunscreen users versus the people who didn't use sunscreen. In a retrospective observational study, though, you just review the medical records from some medical database and identify subjects who had a diagnosis of skin cancer versus those who didn't. You would then figure out which subjects use sunscreen regularly, either from the same database if it had that information, or from a questionnaire. In both cases, you would potentially be able to establish an association between sunscreen use and a reduction in the incidence of skin cancer. However, the problem with observational studies is that they do have problems with confounding factors and they don't prove causation. Now, there are some statistical ways to minimize the chances of confounding factors, and even if you can't absolutely prove causation 100%, you can still infer that causation is very likely from well-designed observational studies. However, observational studies can be misused to try to prove causation when it actually doesn't exist. A recent strong example of this is RFK Jr. claiming that since the number of childhood vaccinations has gone up and the incidence of autism has also gone up, then this implies that vaccination causes autism. 
This is a clear misuse of the data. After all, there are a lot of things that have gone up at the same time that the cases of autism have gone up. For example, coffee consumption has also gone up at the same time that autism has gone up. So, based on RFK Jr.'s own scientific standards, this would be good evidence that drinking coffee causes autism. Of course, you need more than just correlations like that to actually identify causation. However, observational studies still have some good uses. For example, if you could show that there is no correlation between two things, then you don't have to worry about one thing causing another thing. There can't be causation without correlation. To give you a great example of this, here's an observational study that was published recently that showed no correlation between the use of 5-air inhibitors and depression. A study like this is strong evidence that 5-air blockers like finasteride and dutasteride do not cause depression despite what the PFS Foundation and their money-hungry lawyers want you to believe. Observational studies can also be great ways to generate a hypothesis. For example, the link between smoking and lung cancer was first shown in observational studies way back in 1950 by Professor Bradford Hill who we'll talk more about in a few moments. The link between smoking and lung cancer has been confirmed by other prospective observational studies where the risk of lung cancer is proportional to the number of cigarettes smoked per day. Also, studies have shown that the risk of lung cancer drops when people stop smoking. On top of all that, there are mechanistic studies showing that the DNA damage that smoking causes leads directly to the formation of cancer. Knowing all that we do now about the link between smoking and lung cancer, it would be completely un ethical to do a randomized control trial comparing smoking to a placebo to absolutely prove that smoking causes lung cancer. In the case of smoking and lung cancer, there is such a wealth of observational and mechanistic data that no one, not even the tobacco companies today, doubt that smoking causes lung cancer. But the best way to prove causation is with the highest type of primary evidence in the pyramid of evidence, which is a randomized control trial. Randomized control trials remove confounding factors so they actually can be used to establish causation. And a randomized control trial, or RCT, a group of subjects is randomly assigned to get either a treatment or an inactive placebo. The results are then compared between the two groups at the end of the study. If there is a difference in outcomes between the two groups, then you can be sure that the difference was due to the treatment and not any other factor involved. The reason why the groups will not have confounding factors has to do with the statistics of the large groups of people. If the groups are large enough and determined randomly by chance, then there won't be any statistical difference in the characteristics of the groups. The two groups and a randomized control trial have similar traits because the process of randomization uses chance to evenly distribute the characteristics of the participants between the groups. So the two groups are comparable at the start of the study. That ensures that any differences in outcomes are due to the intervention being tested and not because of any pre-existing factors. On top of that, you can remove bias from a randomized control trial by making it double-blinded. That means neither the subjects nor the investigators know until the end of the study which subjects are getting the treatment versus the placebo. So, a large double-blinded randomized control trial is the gold standard for primary clinical research. It can be used to prove causation and to eliminate bias. Randomized control trials are used to fulfill the Bradford Hill criteria, which are a set of nine criteria used to prove that an association is actually causative. The criteria were created by an English epidemiologist named Sir Austin Bradford Hill back in 1965. At the time, he was trying to show that smoking causes lung cancer. He showed that the studies on smoking and lung cancer met all of his nine criteria for causation. So here are the nine criteria. As you can see, these criteria make a whole lot of sense, like showing that the cause precedes the effects, showing the mechanism is plausible, showing the association is very strong, and showing the evidence is consistent and repeatable. Another of the criteria is showing that removing the cause decreases the risk. All these criteria were met by the studies on smoking and lung cancer. For example, it's been shown that smokers who stop smoking actually decrease their risk of getting lung cancer. But in modern times, these same criteria have also been used to show convincingly that LDL cholesterol causes atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. That's because there are dozens of prospective cohort trials and randomized control trials that show a tight correlation between reduction of LDL cholesterol and reduction in cardiovascular risk. This data is very robust, and it can't be dismissed by just saying things like, oh, well, you can't inform causation from association. Bullshit. That's just coping, and it's pretty lame coping at that, because the research on LDL cholesterol, just like with smoking, meets every single prerequisite of the Hill criteria, which proves causation. So, the only level of research that is actually higher than randomized control trials is systematic reviews and meta-analyses. These are just ways to combine the results of other research to come to definitive conclusions 
conclusions. Meta-analyses use sophisticated statistical techniques to analyze multiple studies together to come up with conclusions that are more robust than the conclusions of individual studies. They often show graphs like this one that are known as forest plots. Forest plots show the results of the individual studies and then a combined result at the bottom. They use a horizontal axis that usually shows relative risk and that is centered around the number one. Decimal fractions less than one indicate a reduction in risk and numbers greater than one indicate an increase in risk. As you can see in this figure here, genetic variants that lower LDL cholesterol and drug treatments that lower LDL cholesterol overall lower the risk of cardiovascular disease by 20% because the relative risk is about 0.8. However, now we're starting to get into some statistical concepts like relative risk, and statistics will be the subject of part three for this video series. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop here for now, but we're going to go balls deep to better understand what p-values mean and how statistics are used and sometimes misused to prove or disprove medical claims in the next video. Until then, thank you for watching, God bless, and class dismissed.